Hey guys, what's going on? It's Eli, back with another review video, and with me, my dad, aka Little Blue, and that's right guys, you read the title, you know exactly what it is that me and him are reviewing, and this is a film that I have been meaning for both of us to review together, and seen as how this is one of my dad's top favorite films. I mean, would you consider this your number one favorite film, or...? I'd say it is. I'd say it's, it's tied. It edges out Dark Knight just ever so slightly, because okay. it's, such a, it's such a classic movie. So Absolutely. I'd have to say it is my favorite, yeah. Right. Um, yeah, and also, not to mention, uh, the, the, upload, uh, the uploading of, of this review video out on the day of my dad's birthday. Yep. So, it's, of course, it's fitting enough, and... Yes, that's right, guys. Me and my dad, we're reviewing from 1983, The Right Stuff. Yes, The Right Stuff. A great biopic centering on, you know, a, you know astronauts and the beginning of NASA, correct? The, the, pioneering, the pioneering days of, of space travel and the, really the beginnings of NASA, yes. Yes. And... And I was kind of thinking of this, like, I would think, and I would consider The Right Stuff would be one of the, one of the best, like, movie, movies centering on astronauts. You know, it doesn't matter if, it, if, like, you know, it doesn't matter if an astronaut, mo if an astronaut movie is a biopic or fiction. Like, I would consider this, Apollo 13, and Armageddon, some of the top best ast astronaut films. What do you think? Yeah, <clears throat> I would agree with you. Uh, this being, my, this being my favorite, um... Mm -hmm. This was um, this really went into a lot of detail, and it, I can read the the uh, yeah as the always treatment. as always um, read the description slash the story. Take it away. This adaptation of the nonfiction novel by Tom Wolfe chronicles the first fifteen years of America's space program by focusing on the lives of the Mercury astronauts, including John Glenn, played by Ed Harris, Alan Shepard, played by Scott Glenn. Mm -hmm. The film recounts the dangers and frustrations experienced by those involved with NASA's earliest achievements. It also depicts their families' lives and personal crisis that they endured during an era of great political turmoil and technological innovation. Right. So, uh, definitely uh, the pioneering days of space travel. Um, astronauts nowadays are heavily scrutinized. Are I mean, they have to go through rigorous um, mm -hmm. screening, uh, both physical, mental, and you know, psychological, every way you can possibly imagine. Hard working training, you know. It's, it's extremely hard. It is. They do. A, they do. Where the, what they the, didn't. I don't this, think they did in the beginning. They did is, not do a background check. And this is space we're talking about. So. Right. They did not do a background check on uh, astronauts when they first. They they simply just screened them as, you know, being physically fit and mm -hmm. able to. Uh, you know, and they, they did so many medical experiments on them. Uh, oh, yeah. John Glenn Jr. in the uh, during the uh, press conference. And the press conference is depicted in this movie, mm -hmm. but it's, it, it doesn't go into great detail. But John Glenn actually said uh, he was asked by a reporter in the press conference when they introduced the Mercury astronauts, which was your favorite uh, medical experiment they did. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, he said, if you can figure how many openings there are on the human body... Mm -hmm. and how far you can go into e any one of them. And, of course, the whole place erupts in laughter. And he says, now, you, you tell me your favorite, and, I, and then, then you'll know. Mm -hmm. Because it, they, they did, I mean, they poked and prodded them. There was even an experiment where they, they took a, <clears throat> a needle, a big needle, stuck it in the meaty part of their hand. And you, you saw this, in the, this is depicted in the movie. Yeah. And they had it hooked up to an oscilloscope. And a, a corpsman, I don't even think it was a doctor, just standing there... Uh, you know, and it, he would he would turn the thing up, and they would just literally their hand would just go like that and just flex uncontrollably with that mm -hmm. needle in there, mm -hmm. to the point that when they would finish, it just they couldn't even hardly, you know, they they would literally have to pick their hand up because it just didn't have any any strength left in it. Right. So they did all these experiments on them. They came down to the to the seven, the, you know, the the seven astronauts, um, being, um, you know, being the seven best. Americans to fly into space, mm -hmm. and it yep. was, uh, of course, we ended up not being the first in space. We were so we were so preoccupied. Uh, Warner von Braun, who was the the astronaut, they're the the rocket scientist who 
what came over from, he was captured uh, in World War II, came over to the United States on what was called Operation Paperclip, mm -hmm. where our Americans, uh, American GIs, our government, basically uh, took uh, German scientists, Hitler scientists, mm -hmm. and rocket scientists, and basically gave them a choice, go to prison, or you can work for us. And yeah. the ones that were smart, they chose to work for the United States, including Werner von Braun. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> Werner von Braun was doing all these, you know, he was, the rocket, uh, which was a redstone, they were trying to, you know, they, they kept doing experiments. They kept sending chimpanzees up. Yes. Of course, so they, being depicted in this movie, the whole thing of chimps. And so the astronauts were ready to go. And, they, and Werner von Braun wanted to do one more, he wanted to do one more launch with the monkey. Yeah. And he sent the chimp up. And it gave the Soviet Union time to send Yuri Gagarin up first. So he was the first uh, first man in space, um, orbited the Earth. But when he came back down, they tried to make it sound like it was a major achievement. He actually bailed out of his, out of his capsule on the way down and parachuted and landed in a field mm -hmm. somewhere and identified himself to a Russian farmer, told him who he was, mm. and he got he got help and they picked him up. But yeah, he he didn't even make it back to the ground. He bailed out of his ship before it before it landed. <laughs> it was a, stra a strange story, but it happened. Yeah. Um there's a lot of strange stories like that. Um and I know we talked about during the, you know, the the um we talked about this, had several conversations about this. Yeah. Um in the right stuff uh, Virgil I. Grissom, or known as Gus Grissom, who was actually the second... G Gus Grissom being played by the late Fred Ward. Yes. Um, uh, he was the second astronaut to be chosen to go into space, Alan Shepard being the first. Uh, and because... Alan Shepard being played by Scott Glenn. <clears throat> right. And he actually... Gus Grissom, mm -hmm. when he went up, his capsule... Splashed down in the ocean. Yeah. Now, the idea was, the protocol was that a helicopter would come in, hook on to the um, the capsule, mm -hmm. and then the astronaut, once it was secure, then they would blow the hatch and and get out of the water. And I think actually what they did was that the idea was they carried it to the to the to the ship or the carrier mm -hmm. aircraft carrier, and then they would blow the hatch and he would get out. The yeah. astronaut would get out, but would actually ride it, would stay in the capsule until they got it on board ship. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> that's not what happened with Gus Grissom. His, his in the hatch, film or in reality? Just, in reality. Okay, and this was depicted in... It, it was depicted, but it, it left you... In a you, different way. It left you of. guessing that maybe Gus Grissom panicked and blew the hatch. He didn't. <laughs> In reality, the hatch acts actually and, malfunctioned and blew. And here's the thing about the of the Gus Grissom because he was a cool dude. Oh yeah, very cool. He was a he was a brilliant and, he was a brilliant engineer. And here's a, here's a little trivia for you about Gus Grissom. His sister lived not more than sixty miles away from here in the town of Huntington. Hmm. Yeah, that's yes. nice. Very cool. So. Yeah, Gus Grissom, he was the only astronaut, only Mercury astronaut to go up on Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo. Of course, he died in the Apollo 1 fire, along with Ed White and Roger Chaffee. Yeah, which is established, uh, you know, at the end of the film. Exactly. And, and, and that's, that's, that's common in some biopic films, the aftermath and what happened to these people, you know. As they do in this. Exactly. Uh, and they talk about it. Uh, you know, uh, Alan Shepard could not fly after uh, he was training to be a Gemini commander, but he he succumbed to what's called Meniere's disease, which is an inner, inner ear imbalance that caused him to get be dizzy. He could, sometimes he would have dizzy spells. He mm -hmm. couldn't stand. He would vomit. Just, just really bad. Yeah. So he finally, there was a cure. Flew to California, got, got, had surgery, got, you know, so he was cured. Then he gets on, he gets on the Apollo, uh, he gets on rotation for Apollo and is an Apollo commander. And he had the, he had only ever flown 15 minutes in space on Mercury. He went up the he was the first American in space, flew 15 minutes on a suborbital flight. Now he's all of a sudden commanding an Apollo, um, you know, mm -hmm. Apollo, um, I think it was Apollo 14. Uh -huh. But he, 
uh, yeah, it was it, really fascinating. And uh, Scott, uh, is that is that is that the is that the first name you were saying, Scott? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking. Yeah, Scott Carpenter, Scotty Carpenter, uh, only went up on Scott, Mercury. Scott Carpenter, played by Charles Frank. Yeah. Very intelligent guy, but also very philosophical. He was more interested in what was out there in space. He was more interested in the exploration, not to evaluate his craft. Because mm -hmm. he, he was, they were all test pilots. That's where they came from. They were test pilots. So NASA wanted them to evaluate the performance of the Mercury craft mm -hmm. and how it performed in space, mm -hmm. how it maneuvered. <clears throat> he did that, but he was he was he got preoccupied in orbit mm -hmm. and actually came down, I, I want to say a couple of hundred miles down range from where he was supposed to land. Mm. And it took him a while to find him, but they did find him and he was okay. Mm. He was perfectly fine. Right. But he didn't fly again. NASA did not. He, uh, yeah. Cause one of them was not allowed to fly again and it was him. So. It was him. They just, they just didn't <laughs> let him go up again because they were, they were fit to be tied because he was not paying attention uh, he wasn't well, in the right attitude, and it, this was just this came from one of the NASA administrators who was there, and I've I've heard that uh, heard that interview, and it was uh, yeah. it was unfortunate. It yeah, unfortunate. But he you know he um, he succeeded in his mission, and actually uh, from what I understand, he got some really neat pictures. He uh -huh. he solved the he solved the mystery of the fireflies. John Glenn Jr. on his flight on his orbital flight, uh, he made. He did a three-orbit, completed a three-orbit flight, and then they brought him down because there was a problem with, uh, they, they were afraid there was a problem with the heat shield because the landing bag uh, <clears throat> deployed light came on. They were afraid his heat shield was loose. So they brought him down after three, only three orbits. He was right. supposed to do seven, but he did <clears throat> ended up doing only three. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so by the time, so at that point during one of his orbits, he sees these luminescent, things outside, almost like fireflies, mm -hmm. circling the capsule. Mm. And, you know, he was so fascinated. And it was the sunlight hitting them made them glisten and made them, and they were just flying around in space. Well, it turns out Scott, uh, Scott Carpenter figured out it was, uh, it was the urine dump on the Mercury capsule. It was actually <laughs> astronaut PP that was causing these fireflies. So he solved that mystery. So there were some things he did, uh, conducted experiments and things, and uh, yeah, but kinda, the other astronauts kind of gross, don't you think? Because uh, yeah, well, but that's that, you know they had to have a way to they had to have a way to release the, the yeah urine, yeah no, uh, yeah it's, to that, do a urine dump. That's a, that's understandable. So and a good reason. So yeah. Um, but some of the other astronauts and some of the best ones, especially because you know who were who they were portrayed by, like. Well, first off, because right now, because the the one that's up the very top, and who, of course, was born uh, in West Virginia, uh, Chuck Yeager. Chuck Yeager being but being <clears throat> played slash portrayed by Sam Shepard. Chuck Yeager and my dad and your Paul Paul Blue, as yeah. we re refer to him, um, mm -hmm. he played basketball against Chuck Yeager in high school. Um, he, Mm. Dad played on the Sherman team, and he played for uh, he played for Hamlin, you know, down in Lincoln County. Yeah. And uh, he, they played on the court together. But you know, he went on to be a uh, went went in the uh, Army Air Corps, and I think he was a mechanic. And then he advanced to uh, become a pilot, and he was just a natural. They called it natural stick and runner mm -hmm. pilot. Um, and he shot down five Germans in one day during World War II. Now, that's quite a feat yeah. to shoot down five enemy aircraft in one day. And he became, he was an ace. Uh, mm -hmm. He instantly became an ace. Right. Because um, I think it was once they shot down four, four enemy aircraft, they became they were considered an ace. Mm -hmm. So he, he became an ace in one day. Yeah. Um, so, but... He was never chosen to become an astronaut yeah. because he, Chuck Yeager's story in the right stuff. He was he never had anything higher than a high school education, but and I think he was also I don't mean to cut you off, but I think he was also pulse elite or however I'm trying to say it. If you get what I'm trying to say over the, the whole thing of NASA and astronauts, he was know? pretty. He was 
he was pretty bitter about it, I think. Yeah, because that's another word to that's another word to, he to, and, to, to, uh, to say. So. He and Deke Slayton did not like each other. Deke Slayton became head of the astronaut office. Yeah, Deke Slayton. Yeah, being played by and Scott Paulin. Deke Slayton was never went up in Mercury and, because he had the, uh, he had a, a heart problem. Not a heart problem, but it, it was a his it was uh, I think it was AFib. His heart was out of rhythm, but then. Several years later, he, you know, he, as he's head of the astronaut office, uh, he, it corrects itself, mm -hmm. and then he eventually With, goes up on Skylab. Yeah, and the whole thing for of Apollo Soyuz, I should say, rather. Yeah, and the whole thing of Chuck and Dick, Dick, they Deke, they they never liked each other. That was kind of in the movie, wasn't it? Like, no, no, it was uh, never in the movie. Oh, uh, okay, it was not never even in like the movie. A, not even a little bit. <coughs> nope. Like, yes, I know the movie doesn't establish that, but if there was anything that kind of showed. We're not even sure they were they were stationed at Ed, Edwards Air Force Base at the same time. They may have been, and they probably were, along with, um, um, you know, along with um, mm -hmm. Gordon Cooper, Gordon Cooper, and um, Alan Shepard, Gus Grissom. Gus Grissom, yeah. No, Alan Shepard was a he was a Navy pilot. He was what they call an aviator, yeah. and supposedly um, Navy Navy pilots are better than any than any because they can land on a they can land on a on an aircraft carrier that's pitching a, that's pitching up and down on the you know on the ocean yeah uh, so technically they are better pilots they're more skilled they have to be because mm -hmm. yeah. an air force a standard air force pilot could not land on an aircraft carrier they right couldn't do it mm -hmm. yeah and more on chuck yeager because like throughout the film because always trying to do new things you know and when it comes to flying and like one thing in the movie like breaking the sound what's it again the sound barrier that's right yeah in this movie and um and the x1 Exactly. Manufactured even, by Bell Corporation. Even, even a couple of times where Chuck Yeager was close <coughs> to dying, you know, like crashing. But he, he was. But he, but he succeeds. <coughs> He's succeeding, he, like controlling the plane still, even how high he went, he still survived. He, he had what they call the right stuff. Exactly. He, he, and the words, the right stuff, being said in the movie. He could. That's uh, sometimes, like. In movies where the title of the movie would be said, so. he he could almost laugh in the face of death. I mean, and, and he pretty much did a couple <laughs> yeah. of times. But he was um, he was quite a pilot. Um, lived lived a long yep. life. I mean, he just died just a few years ago. Yeah, as got, of this recording. So when they dedicated Jaeger Airport and named it after him, it used to be Canal Valley Airport. Mm -hmm. uh, I went up there that day. My friend of mine and I, we were we were going to college at West Virginia State University, and we. We got out of class and we drove up to the airport to watch, uh, to watch the dedication ceremony. And he was the first official plane. He flew his plane out of Jaeger Airport, and so he was the first official flight to mm. leave Jaeger Airport. So I got to see him up there, and he took the governor of the state of West Virginia with him at the time, who was Arch Moore. Mm. Took him up with him, and they they took off. You know, of course, everybody's <laughs> watching them take off, and and you know they got around. You know, everybody nice. applauded. It was really cool nice. to see that. So I did get to see him in person at a distance, but uh, right. yeah, he was not a fan of uh, he was not a fan of uh, NASA. At even all. even still, how old he got, he wasn't. I I don't think so. Um, Unless he kind of you know. Kind of lightened over NASA, I guess. I don't know. But. A former colleague of mine actually drove him uh, somewhere. They were he was in Charleston for some kind of an event, and he drove him. And he was they talked, and he he does not like to talk about his career. He likes to hmm. talk about hunting and fishing. That's what he loves. Not and, even not even talk about planes or no. My oh former my, my, my former colleague not even planes. My former colleague uh, wow. happens to be a, a huge an avid hunter and an avid fisherman. So he knows all the places in West Virginia. He knows all the tricks and everything. So he, mm. he got into a conversation with Chuck Yeager about it. And he said he had been warned that Chuck Yeager's kind of standoffish. He doesn't, he's not, he's kind of, he's, he, you know, he's kind of abrasive. Not, not a great personality. Just a, But he said mm. that when he started talking to him about hunting and fishing, he said he really opened up. Well, and I'm sure because, you know, Chuck Yeager, he was a nice guy, but some certain things... Well, like, you got to figure. You know, what he went through in his lifetime, the, 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 as close as he came yeah, to death, yes. the times that he did, yep. and all the planes that he flew <clears throat> and could fly, Absolutely. why in the world would he want to talk about that? You know, when he, when he, his passions were hunting and fishing. In fact... Uh, Sam Shepard, when he studied, he studied the part of Chuck Yeager. I mean, he went and spent time with Chuck Yeager and went fishing with him. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like, if if he were to talk about planes, <coughs> like I'm thinking, like what, like 
I'm no doubt about the Chuck Yeager being an expert on planes and the designs <laughs> yeah, no and doubt. so on. I'm just saying because no doubt, but he's he was probably an expert on hunting and fishing too. Yeah, that's what I'm, you got to think. I'm just saying because yeah. you know, but um, he would have been an extraordinary astronaut. There's no question. He would have. If he but, had gone through the training and gone through the screening, he would have passed with flying colors. But because he didn't have a college degree, that's what NASA wanted. They wanted college educated candidates. Yeah, but even with but even even though he didn't have that, he was still pulse by NASA and bitter and so on. Yeah, it was it was just you know they rejected him in the beginning yeah. and uh, yeah that would kind of leave a sore spot. It really would because yeah. he he would have to know that if anybody any of the pilots that they bought that he could outfly any of them and he could yeah no question about it. But NASA just didn't see it that way because they wanted mm -hmm. college straight. Now granted, Gus Grissom he was a he was a, an a, an amazing engineer. He's been called he was a, he was a gifted engineer. And 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 an extraordinary pilot, a mm -hmm. test pilot. He was he was an ace in Korea. He shot down I don't know how many planes, but he was a, he was an ace in Korea, uh, <clears throat> flying a different plane. Yeah, course. yeah. Probably I'd say probably an F four U F four Saber jet. Uh huh. F four U one A Saber. Yeah, and the other astronauts, uh, John Glenn and Gordon Cooper, they were great in this. How you know and who who betrayed them? Ed Harris betraying John Glenn and Dennis Quaid betraying Gordon Cooper. I think Ed Harris actually channeled John Glenn Jr. I really do. He mm -hmm. he looked like him. The two people that looked the most their part were I think Scott Glenn as Alan Shepard. Three. Scott Glenn as Alan Shepard, Ed Harris as John Glenn, and Fred Ward as Gus Grissom. They absolutely were dead ringers. For the real guys, yeah. If you, if you look at the comparison, I think I read something that what the John Glenn had to say about Ed Harris, how he betrayed him and such. Like it had to do something with a letter or something. If you read this, if you know about this, I, I mean, don't know about. This. I read it in the trivia of its IMDb page. So, um, but um, but yeah, Ed Harris is John Glenn. His story, because um, yeah, what about John Glenn? The film. Well, John Glenn was, uh, you know, he was. Um, he was kind of the Boy Scout. Hmm. All the other astronauts were... I think he was like, kind of like, yeah, like, yeah, and kind of like the leader of this group, you know. <laughs> he, was, he was the moral leader because yeah. really what happened was, and they portray this in the movie, and it did happen. Hmm. Um, only and, it didn't happen where they showed it. It happened at, a, it happened at, a, at an island off, off Calif the coast of California where they were meeting at, privately, and, it, and it, it came out, and there was a, it, was a, it got to be a really heated discussion and it was between John Glenn and Alan Shepard mm -hmm. and what it was was all these astronauts now it's really weird because nowadays if this something like this would happen it'd be the biggest scandal in the world you know it would just be you've seen what, what all the, scan, the the sex scandals that's gone on in polit in, with politicians and in, yeah. in, 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 in Hollywood and everything well the astronauts a lot of them were they corrals man they were you know they were Flanders. I mean, they they got around. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And they were married and shouldn't have been doing that. Taking girls Which up is, to their, room, their hotel room in the middle of the night. And they were even like, some of the astronauts were in this like <clears throat> bar and they're watching girls oh, swimming. Yeah. <laughs> and there were girls just like that. They And you notice in that, those girls that come into that scene, they say, they say, Yes. Three down. Yes. Two to go. Or four down, two to go. I was wondering. I was, I was, I was. Getting the feeling that that's what you're bringing up because I was thinking of that too. Yes, that too. So. The astronauts, the secretary of the astronaut office, and I cannot recall her name. Morrow, I think, is her last name. Well, it's, she no, she's. I don't even think she's portrayed in this. Okay. She said that. Hmm. Uh, she said it was the strangest thing because none of the that they that the press never talked about it. They knew it went on, but they just didn't talk about it. And she said that you know John Glenn was like he was the Boy Scout. He. He just told him, kind of knock it off. You know, you're 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 going to get us all in trouble. And he yeah. was right because he was afraid it would it would paint a dark picture on it would it would put a black eye on the program hmm. and and make every make it all look bad. And so he <clears throat> he just told him he said, hey, you know, knock it off. Yeah, and, um, yeah. And, True. They, and Alan Shepard was like, well, doesn't every person have the right to do you know live their life the way they want to live it? Mm -hmm. Uh, which was wrong headed, yeah. But uh huh. Okay, and now I think we kind of saved the best for last of the astronauts. Gordon Cooper being portrayed by Dennis Quaid. I think 
He was one of the best. The highlights of this movie. He was in in real life. He was kind of they they portrayed him as kind. Of, they kind of said he was like a kind of flaky. You know, he was just kind of kind well, of swagger, cocky. You know, was kind he of, was he like that in reality? I mean, even how he was depicted in this movie. Like, yes, yes. In fact, and going on at times, going on at his wife. You know, who's the best pilot? Like flyer. However, however he says it, he know? almost lost his he almost lost his Mercury flight because he did a low pass over the airbase when he was coming in mm -hmm. and did a low pass so low that uh, one of the officers was in the window mm. and was and he was level with him as he came by mm. scared him to death <laughs> and they uh. they and the one of the the uh, one of the NASA administrators called called Alan Shepard and said yeah. do you still have your suit and he said yeah he said well you're going up next he said cuz i'm going to i'm going to ground um, i'm going to ground um mm -hmm. Gordon Cooper. I'm going yeah. to ground Gordo. Mm -hmm. Well, at that point, Deke Slayton had stepped in as head of the astronaut office. And he was just, he stepped in and he said, no, we can't ground him. It'll destroy his career. So he was admonished mm -hmm. for what he did, mm -hmm. but he did get to make his Mercury flight, which was good because he ended up flying on, on a Gemini uh, mission as well. Right. He didn't make it to Apollo. He left the astronaut corps before, he left NASA before mm. Apollo began. Yeah, some others that uh, being in this movie, uh, Donald, the late Donald Moffat portraying Lyndon B. Johnson, because we did get a press, we did get an appearance of Lyndon B. Johnson in this movie. He How was, he's being portrayed by Donald Moffat, that is. He was another. He he absolutely channeled Lyndon B. Johnson because <laughs> Lyndon, that is just that was Lyndon B. Johnson's. He pulled off a good likeness personality. Uh, I mean, he was not. He was never like that in front of the public. He was. More, you know, he maintained more of a, well, you know, uh, yeah, presidential. You know, his his uh, his decorum was was appropriate in public, but and, by, behind Clay, he was he was, he cussed and carried on, and yeah, just, you know. And Wally, what's his last name? Wally Shira, being played but being played slash betrayed by Lance Henriksen, if I'm saying yeah. a. Uh, Bishop in the Alien franchise, right, and was the voice of Kerchak and Disney's Tarzan. So well, him betraying uh, Wally. So what well, about, he was what about known, Wally? He was known as a jokester. He was a he was a practical joker. Uh, in reality, yeah. And they said they literally said that nobody enjoyed Wally's jokes more than Wally, and <laughs> more than himself, more than himself. And he I would, guess uh, I guess maybe <clears throat> maybe it's. My guess is probably they just couldn't understand his jokes, or they well, couldn't, they couldn't get into his humor, what he was doing. He when he would yeah. do, they would have to do urine specimens at the, oh. at every turn. You know, every day they'd have to turn in a urine specimen to the nurse. Yeah, that so whole one day that he whole came in, that whole sequence where they're at that place and that nurse until we get to that because one day he came in with a big giant jar filled with something that looked like urine and left it on the <laughs> nurse's desk mm. with his name on it, like he had peed this big now, giant I jug don't, full of pee. I don't seem <clears> to remember. <throat> I don't seem to remember seeing that in the movie. Movie. It was not in the movie. Okay. It was in. Yeah. It was, if you ever see the if movie, I was, I was about. If I was having a Mandela effect or something, no, because okay, I remember. I remember clearly now. It was not portrayed. It was not in this movie. The so. Tom Hanks miniseries that was produced by mm. Tom Hanks called From the Earth to the Moon. Yeah. That was portrayed. They should. You get to see Deeks. Yeah, because what happened in the right stuff that was in an episode of that show, of that miniseries, no doubt about it. Yeah. Um, but uh, also, um, yeah, that like, okay, I was gonna. There was something else I was going to mention about the astronauts, but yeah, that whole sequence with them at that place and doing all those tests and that nurse, you know, and yes. that nurse was something. That nurse was something. She was, and she was portrayed by uh, Joan Crawford. Yeah, the late John Joan Crawford, who went from like a singer actress to a news reporter, and unfortunately, she died while, as a, when she was a news reporter, and you know, it was a helicopter accident, so. Um, but that nurse just like, just being something and her interactions, especially with, uh, <laughs> with, with Gordon Cooper. So, and how she even, the nurse wanted Gordon to bring in his wife. So if you remember that, cause yeah, she was, um, he called her nurse Lurch. Uh, he, nurse, because, yeah, but, okay, now I get it. Yeah, Why he, did I not think he, of he that? He called her Nurse Lurch, and she was because uh, of Lurch from the Adams family. Yeah, she was um, because she was so. Wait a second, it's not Joan Crawford. What was it? Dummy me. Well, but, but she her real name was Nurse Jane Lurch. Dorn Dorn Dornacker Dornacker. Yeah. But she. Why was, did I? I don't know why I thought of Joan Crawford. I'm so she sorry. She had. She basically had. 
The late Jane, Jane Dornacker plays Nurse Merge. Yeah, that's... So if, did, he, did he say Lurch or Merge? I think he called her Lurch. I, well, I, think I mean, he did, it says her name right. was Merch. Yeah. So, but I think yeah. that he called her that jokingly. So she she had his number. She knew in this movie she did. I don't know if that's the way it was in real life, but uh, yeah, she had she had uh, Gordon Cooper's number. She knew there, what he was all about. There, and she knew how to. There was an actual nurse merch, right, or something like. I don't know if and, there and was. If, and if the uh, astronaut, if the astronauts themselves ever mentioned about a nurse, you know. Yes. Um, but again, like the the nurse was something, and just getting on Gordon's skin, and again when bringing. Again, she wanted him to bring in his wife, and when we see, because they're kind of, we see that they're laughing at, in the office. So yeah, we yeah. Fought, like we like throughout that because seeing that nurse just having a serious face and such, like not even smiling, and yet we do hear her laughing. So there was a scene toward the end when uh, the this uh, it was actually it, it was called uh, it was it was called I think I remember what the designation was, but it was called it was an interceptor. Um, and it was called the, uh, it was called, I think it was called a Starfighter was its, was its nickname. Oh. It was the ship that, uh, it was that big, that silver pointy fighter that Jaeger took up at yeah. the, toward the end, with, right at the end of the movie. With that happening and also the, uh, the astronauts there, they're there for the celebration. Right. And, and at it, the celebration, in like Houston, there's a, Texas, and there's a dancer <clears throat> because they, they moved all the, yeah, they moved all of the, uh, Sally Ride, and she was her, Sa Sal, I think that was her name, but she she was a real fan dancer. Back, I looked Sally, her up back in the day. Uh, what was her now? Sally who again? I think her, I think it was actually I think she actually played herself. If it, if it's in there, maybe. Uh, well, we got Sa Sally we Rand. Got, we got to look for the name. No, okay, Peggy Davis Peggy, played Sally Rand. Peggy Davis. Sally Rand Pe was an actual Peggy pe fan dancer. Peggy Davis played slash portrayed Sally Rand. Sally so. Rand. Back in the day, she was a she was a well known fan dancer, mm -hmm. and so she. But yeah, they had this big barbecue celebration. Yeah, that Lyndon yeah. B. Johnson hosted for him. You know. <clears throat> and it, you know, there's also, and they moved him to Texas. They moved him to Houston, Texas. There was also a vice president uh, with a hat. The cowboy hat or something. Well, that's Lyndon B. Johnson. Oh, it is? Yes. Okay. He was vice president. Oh, when, jo okay. when John F. Kennedy was president, he was vice president. Right, Then right, when, right. when Kennedy was, was assassinated, um, he uh -huh. actually... Um, he uh, actually took over as president. He was right, swearing. Right, I mean, right, right, right. Um, also, can't forget to also can't forget to mention because Jeff Goldblum in being in this movie was one his, of the recruits in his early days of his of his acting career. Uh, there were there was him and there was Harry Harry Shearer that played the other recruiter. They were they and were hilarious. Harry is best, of course, <clears throat> one of the top cat voice cast members of The Simpsons, voicing yeah. Mr. Burns. Yeah, he was he was uh, really good in that. As was Jeff Goldblum. I think one of the funniest scenes is when they. They show up. <clears throat> this isn't really how it happened. They didn't actually come to the aircraft carrier to uh, mm -hmm. to recruit Alan Shepard. They, they he was selected. Uh, yeah, he actually didn't find out he was selected until like the following Monday because he on Friday he found out they were they were calling for astronauts mm -hmm. and he was all depressed because he hadn't gotten an invitation. Then Monday he gets the invitation. It hadn't been delivered to him, so. He finally gets he finally gets it, you know, and then he gets invited to go to Washington to try out to become an astronaut. The way they portray it in the right stuff, these two recruiters show up to get him to recruit him to do it, and you know he comes he comes in for a landing. He was a jokester too. He liked to imitate. You know, he'd, he'd imitate Jose Jimenez. Who was the jokester again? Uh, Alan Shepard. Okay, okay, yeah. He yeah. would do, he would imitate Jose Jimenez, who was a character on the Ed Sullivan show. I was about to say because <coughs> uh, we we see the Ed Sullivan. Because they're watching Ed Sullivan a couple of times. Yeah. But, and, he, but he... You know, archival footage, obviously, of Ed Sullivan's. So. Right. But anyway, he... So, back to Alan Shepard. They, they're... Jeff Goldblum, mm -hmm. his character, and... The recruit... Uh, he's just called the, the two, recruiter. There were two recruiters. They're, they're, they're only called recruiters, and as they're credited, so... They're, they're on the... They're, they're, they're sick. I mean, they're, they're seasick. They're puking over the side. And that's what's so uh, funny, because when they come up, you know, they've still... Uh, Jeff Goldblum has still got puke on the side of his face. He's wiping <laughs> his face off and he keeps trying to talk and, you know, retching yeah. because he just, his stomach's trying to make yeah. him throw up again. Oh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> so they, they're trying to, you know, trying to talk and Alan Shepard's just standing there listening. You know, he's just cool, he's cool and collected, you know, <laughs> cool, calm and collected. Yeah. And he says, sounds dangerous. And he says, extremely dangerous, you know. And yeah, then I almost he says, forgot he says, about that. Count me in. You know, <laughs> great. Scene. I almost forgot about that. That yeah. didn't happen. 
That didn't actually happen, but they they put it in the movie to make it you know yeah. to make it more interesting. Obviously, so, yeah. yeah, yeah. There are there's a lot of stuff in biopic films that didn't happen in reality, but hey, you know, they sometimes work, don't you think? They do. Yeah. Also, we can't forget to talk about this: the wives, the astronauts' wives, because. Boy, are they something in this movie? They went through it, man. They, oh yeah, they really went through it. A lot of under a lot of stress, pressure. You had John, you had John Glenn Jr.'s wife. Uh, uh John, <coughs> where was she? Uh, I'm trying so, to remember. Her. Annie Glenn. Annie Glenn. A Annie I, Glenn. I knew her name. I Annie, just couldn't think of it. Annie Glenn being played slash portrayed by Mary Jo. Mary Jo uh, Deshano. Deshano, yeah. So and she. The thing about his wife is she's kind of. Uh, she has a speech impediment. Yeah. She like, has yeah. a speech impediment. Exactly. And they're trying to hide it. They think she's stuck up. That may have happened. That may have actually happened that the yeah. other astronaut wives and the astronauts yeah. thought that she was stuck up because she wasn't saying anything. Now, was she first. like that in reality? Like, yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Just, she had she had a speech impediment. And, well, that uh, that's important for that was impo obviously that's that was important for them to include that. So yeah, and she and but you know all the astronauts' wives. I mean, she stuck by him, stuck by John Glenn, too, and yeah. the other astronauts' wives did too. But you know they were the, a lot kind of, of astronauts. Kind of except Gordon's wife. I don't know, because... Oh, I think they were, you know, they loved each other, but she just... Yeah. If that were, if that really was the way it happened, who knows? Gordon Cooper. Gordon, I mean, the real Gordon Cooper may have seen that movie and thought, why are they portraying this like this, you know? <laughs> well, I think, well, any of the astronauts who were still alive at that time, obviously, because they, they saw this and... Well, it, the, the part where John Glenn is telling them to knock it off, you know, saying, you know, let's keep our, let's keep our... Our uh, our wicks dry and our pants zipped around here. He was yeah, that he, whole, just coming down on that. Really happened, and I guarantee you, the astronauts saw that. And they're like because oh, they knew that whole thing of the the press and the vice president trying to talk with John's wife, yeah. and she refuses. Yeah. I tell you, because that scene and how she refuses, and <laughs> look, like she if she doesn't want to do it, then just leave her alone. Just, but they just. But they just refuse, and boy does boy does John let them have it. And to the guy who he talks to, you know, oh, yeah. you're out of line. Yeah, yeah. And, and every see, everybody else has has John's side. So. And, and the press, the, uh, I think one of them did push that guy that was getting John, in John's face. Johnson's so. press, yeah. Johnson's press secretary comes back, you know, and tells him, you know, says that she she won't do the interview. Yeah, you know, and then this the last time when they say no, no means no, and and and, 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 and Tr Trudy, the, Trudy speaking for for her, you know, yeah. telling them, you know, she says they're, no, they're protecting her exactly. They, yeah. they become very protective, which which they, oh yeah, they, I mean the wives they come together. the wives they do they do bond and it's like they become they, bond, they become and, besties. Yeah, so. they do. So so they <laughs> that's true. So you see Lyndon Johnson, you see you literally see his his limousine rocking. Yeah, he's just sitting there in the neighborhood. You know, he's just sitting in his limousine. And he's sitting there, and he's going, Kansas, gladiolas, can't anybody deal with a housewife? You know, the big babies. Because he, because he didn't. Yeah, he, he just, he just <laughs> literally sitting there like that. You know, the vice president, just... vice president of the United States, might have happened, but it was I'm it, sure. artistic license. You know, who knows? It depends, like what really happened. But, it, but there was, yeah, there was a lot of um, in the beginning. There was a lot of uh, the astronauts figured out. That they were pretty much they had a they were a powerful force you know the, all of them together because they were people they were looked up to I mean they were practically worshipped well, by Americans you know because yeah. they were they were American and, heroes yeah and we can't forget to mention because we also can't forget to mention how the astronauts they all get together like at this bar you know I think yeah. it's pa Pancho Panchos 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 Pancho ha Barnes Panchos bar. Happy Rodham Happy Bean, Bottom Riding Club being played slash portrayed by Kim Stanley yeah was the, was that an actual person Pancho uh, pa Panchos was probably a real place in, there, out in the desert and if there was a Pancho Barnes close to uh, close to Edwards Air Force Base and it was you know probably the 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 test pilots did hang out there. Mm -hmm. and, and Chuck know, Yeager being there too. Chuck Yeager was there, and, and even the recruiters <laughs> showing up. As well, so sure. That's when they went came to recruit, you know, and that that right. may very well have happened. To, yeah, to, they might have to get you know to find out who was there and to get them in. But they, you know, they pretty much had scouted. They knew who was out there, mm -hmm. and they and they invited the ones that they they thought would be the best candidates. Uh huh. And more on the wives because from Betty Grissom being played slash portrayed by Veronica Cartwright and Chuck's wife Glennis Yeager being played slash portrayed by Barbara Hershey. Barbara Hershey. I. Haven't you seen her in anything else? Because I I've, I've seen her because she's beautiful. What was a beautiful I, woman? I remember I her. Is, I remember. I remember her best uh, portraying the Queen of Hearts in the ABC show Once Upon a Time. Okay. And who is the mother of the evil queens? Is Barbara Hershey still alive? 
Yeah, yeah, no, she is. She is. After this recording, she is. She's still alive. Okay. She's still okay. alive. Yeah, oh, okay. okay. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure because some of these people are not alive anymore. <laughs> yes, uh, not all of them. All of them are, most of them are still alive. Scott so. Glenn is still alive, right? Yeah. Ed so, Harris. But let's not go into that. Dennis Quaid. Fred, Fred Ward Fred, passed away. Yeah, but let's not go into that. Just like, but more on the wives. Like, um, again, because Trudy did at one point went back to where they they lived at because they had to move. Like, what about that? Because again, whether if it did happen in reality, still we don't know. But it was it was interesting to see how that played out. You know, he was it's, she left him, and because she was just tired of worrying, and she just she was trying to run away from it. And <clears throat> who knows if that really happened. Happened in the movie, but she, I mean, but, of course, they she still loved him and, and so on. Yeah, but, but she, she just, just she just had to get away for a little while. Yeah, because uh, um, she realized that you know it was just it was a dangerous dangerous job they had yeah. as test pilots because mm -hmm. there was really a, a one in three chance that they would not come back alive. Yeah, that's that's incredible odds, you know. And Pamela Reed, who plays Trudy Cooper, we have seen her in something else. I don't know about you, if how many, how many, you, how many, how many other movies you've seen her in, but I remember her best from Bean, the yes. Mr. Bean film. Yes, playing the wife of what's in face. Exactly. I think she was she was in that. She, I remember her in that, and uh, uh -huh. it was uh, actually I, I can't. I'm trying to place her in that. Well, again, the wife of what's in face who has to deal with Bean. You know. There so. we go. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. One of the other actresses who plays the wives. I I know I've probably seen her. in seen her in something else uh lewis shepherd uh louise shepherd louise shepherd louise shepherd she's the wife of who i forget alan, uh, shepherd. alan she yeah because louise shepherd being played slash portrayed by kathy baker if it is who i think it is um yes it is i remember her from she because uh she was in uh saving mr banks and she was also in no oh, she was also in edward scissorhands so but anyways um and also, because about Glennis Yeager, she was just wanting her husband to try new things, you know? Yeah, and she... And according she to did, Chuck Yeager, But she so. did not want him... She didn't want him to start living in the past. And yeah. Start, and start, you know, she just said, if I ever see that, you know, talking about the good old days and, and, and trying to relive yesterday, she said, I'm, I'll be right out that door. I don't <laughs> yeah. know what her hang-up was about that. In yeah. The, in the, the way they portrayed her in the movie, I was just like... Why would that be such a maybe that maybe she, <clears throat> maybe that's not what happened? But. That scene reminds me of a Bruce Springsteen song called "Glory Days" because that's pretty much what she's saying. Is mm. to talking about how people will talk about people that aren't really doing anything in their lives anymore, and they were maybe high school sports stars or whatever, mm -hmm. and now they're they're trying and and they're they're boring. They have to lead a boring life, so they have to go back and think back. You know, and talk about the good old days when they did this and when they did that, and that's all they ever talk about. You see, yeah. So um, and also. Uh, Levin Helm, he, he portrays Jack Ridley, and he's also the narrator of this film. Now Ridley was a real character. He was an, he he was an actual engineer, mm -hmm. and he and he, uh, you know, he would uh, be on those planes, um, and I, he would coordinate between the test pilots and the you know the ground and everything. So it, yeah. Um, also, because other things that happened in the film, I want to mention because unfortunately, at one point, very later on in the film. Um, you know, Pancho's bar, it was caught on fire. Yeah, that, and that was just in the movie. Who knows if that really happened in real life? And whoever says this, like, remembering the best pilots, astronauts, well, from pictures at Pancho's bar. So exactly. exactly. If you know what I'm talking about, that yeah, whole thing. exactly. And that whole thing, again, with uh, Gus Grissom and how they blamed it on him at first, you know? Mm -hmm. And how, you know, his wife just upset and because she was expecting that they were going to do, like, be at the White House and so on, and he just, like... You know, he just, he shouts, but it's not that he's shouting at her. It's just shouting because how upset he is because it wasn't his fault. Like, it was an accident and so on. Right. Yeah. I right. think that was that was really well acted and a really good scene. Oh, it was, but it never happened. Of, cor <laughs> of course not. But at the same time, just, you know. It, I mean, he was accused of blowing the of blowing the hatch. There were a lot of yeah. people that thought he did. My granddaddy, our granddaddy actually thought that he yeah. did. And I told him, I said, no, he didn't. I had to, to explain to him how they figured out that he did not blow that hatch. Exactly. He, he was telling the truth. He did not blow that and hatch. And did they did did they eventually figure it out that it wasn't? They did. He was absolved of, mm. of, of, the, of any wrongdoing. Right. And they did figure it out. Why Good. they portrayed it that way in the movie, I have no idea. Because he, he was kind of portrayed as being kind of nervous, trying to get his helmet off yeah. and jittery. 
And he was not, that was not Gus Brissom. I mean, who was would, none of those who pilots. Would, I mean, who would not freak out at something like that? You well, know? but those guys, he wasn't. I'm just yeah. saying, because, he know. was He was scared. <laughs> he was scared, yes. But, you know, and he even said in the press conference, he said, he said, I, I was scared. And, 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 and the, again, who, the would, reporter, who would not be scared at something like that? The reporter who asked him that said, you were what? And he said, I was scared, okay? And everybody laughed. And it was, but they laughed because it was like, here's an astronaut admitting he was scared. And these guys were looked upon as being just, you if, know, heroes. If, it's like, but you even know, even heroes get scared. It's like, you know, if you were put in that situation, <clears throat> you would know how it feels. Uh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> and then, then, you know, he literally, and this did happen, and they did portray it in the movie. He started sinking when he climbed out, when he jumped out of the capsule, mm -hmm. <clears throat> helicopter attaches its cord right. to try and pull it up. Yeah. It's taking on water and it's weighing the helicopter down. They finally had to let it go. Yeah. And, and they um, do, of course, they save him and so on. They save him, but he didn't have, there was a valve on his suit that he didn't, he failed to close off. Yeah. And there was water seeping in and it was weighing him down. He, his suit was filling with seawater. And it was just weighing him down, and it was all he, all the energy he, he, it took him, all his strength, to stay, to tread water until they could get a line down to him, and he almost drowned, very mm -hmm. nearly drowned. But they did manage to pull the capsule out, um, right? Years later, and this was on, uh, this was on National Geographic. Gus Grissom's brother was mm -hmm. there, and Gus Grissom's brother looked exactly. Like Gus Grissom, when you saw him, you saw that's what Gus Grissom would look like. It's kind if, of it's, as he aged if he had lived. It's kind of rare if a brother, and yes. a, a relative would look exactly like. You but know. when they pulled his capsule, they found it under the ocean. They pulled it up out of the out of the ocean. There was that plunger in place, where he had not touched the plunger to blow the hatch. Mm. That was that was the second proof. They, they already knew he hadn't done it. They proved that he hadn't done it just by the bruise that was on that was not on his hand. Because all the other Mercury astronauts, mm -hmm. they had a bruise on their hand where they had to hit this plunger. They had to come down on it real hard with the palm of their hand to 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 blow the hatch. And you couldn't just you couldn't just go like that. You had to come down on it. So yeah. every astronaut had a bruise in the palm of their hand, except Gus Grissom. Mm. And that's how they, I think they made the determination that, yeah. no, he didn't blow the hatch. He yeah. never blew the hatch. It just blew on its own. And then when they recovered the craft back in probably around, I'd say probably around 2004, somewhere along in there, mm -hmm. maybe, uh, they, it was that, it was intact, that, that, um, plunger was intact. It had not moved. Yeah. And a couple other things to to mention, because like um, that one part where they wanted the astronauts, they wanted a cock a cockpit or something like, or and a window, a hatch or something like. Yeah, they, I don't know if that was true or not. If you know, <clears throat> you know that part. So yeah, I don't know if that was uh, McDonnell Douglas designed the Mercury space capsule. They they built it so they could literally they could literally make changes on it as they went, and uh -huh. they, the, the prototype didn't have any windows on it. Right, they didn't have control jets on it. They they thought. You know, these, these German scientists thought they could just do everything. And the astronaut was just an occupant. But the astronaut needed to be a pilot uh -huh. because that's what they do. Yeah. Also, early, very early on in the film, there were two deaths. You remember those? Because then there were two funeral services. Yeah, there were test pilots. It showed just how right. dangerous being a test pilot Even was. Even, like, the first one, and that's how the movie opens. Yes. Because, you know, the first one, the first test pilot dies, and this guy comes to the wife and, you know... She and starts crying. She yeah. sees him coming, and they have and, a child. Just, yeah, uh, <sighs> he was like he was like God. the priest there. He was like the harbinger of death. I yeah, mean, he would come and him in, singing, or and... the angel of death. Yeah, and uh -huh. it was just really eerie. So there's that, and also some 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 scenes and sequences where you know they're they're going up into space, like like the one where uh, it's Gordon Cooper. He and someone else like they try they go they're at Australia. To get in contact and also to view. Yeah, it was a tracking station. Exactly, and they meet with these people <clears throat> in Australia. Yeah, um, they have uh, they have nowadays they have tracking stations in Madrid, Spain, and I don't know where else. But they're 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 different intervals yeah. around you know. Now, <clears throat> yeah. Now, when Gordon Cooper, when Gordon went to Australia, that was when well, John Glenn went into space. Yeah, John Glenn was right. in orbit when he and. It seemed like John Clinton, it looked like he might, was looked like he was going to be killed, but we then cut straight to when that celebration in Texas is happening. So, yeah, yeah he, 
Yeah, he survived. The heat, the heat so. shield stayed intact. Exactly. Is basically what happened. So it was, yeah, it was. Um, uh-huh. but, but, I mean, these guys, they, these, and these, these capsules were so, I, I don't want to say fragile, but they, yeah, technically they were fragile. Uh-huh. And you could, and, you know. Yeah, and finally, Gordon Cooper going into space. And he did become the best flyer pilot, How you know, yeah. however he, it's said. He, he flew farther and higher than any man. It, that day he became the fastest yeah. man alive. Because he, <laughs> he said it was the fast. And he, I love how they portray that when he is going up. Absolutely love that. Because mm. he is just, you know, he's, and they man, did it he's right. they did it up, right. you know, off we go into the wild blue yonder, and you know. They did it right and good. <clears throat> you know, altimeter is working, oxygen is go, you know, yeah. well, you know and, on the... On uh, fuel is that, go altimeter on the top peg, and then he gets up there, and then all of a sudden he just smiles and he goes, "Oh my lord, what a heavenly light!" And the music they're playing, it just, it just, it really moves you. Yeah, the music, just, the music is good in this too. In the oh movie. yeah, it was, it was, it was. It, the music is awesome, and uh-huh. the way that movie ended, and you know, closing narration, the, the closing aftermath narration, of what happened yeah. to the astronauts. Some of them got killed, um, and. They got, they got, it was, it happened in reality, right? Because what you were saying about him going into space, you know, um, what you said, because. Uh, now say that again, I'm sorry. What, when he, when Gordon went up to space and what you were saying, like that happened in reality, right? Because. Oh yeah, he was the last, he was the last American to go into space the, the, alone. The things that you were saying, because like, you know. what? Yeah, but let me tell you, when he went up, he made 22 orbits around the earth mm-hmm. and he, everything was shutting down on his, on his, in his space capsule, uh-huh. and everything was shutting down. And when he re-entered, he had to do it manually. Oh. He had to fly that thing like a like a plane and like a pilot and get it set up. You know, and they used they had control jets that was basically peroxide that would be ejected at, and he would psh, psh, you know, and he would put them in a position, you know, in control jets that would put them in a position where they mm-hmm. needed to be because if they hit the atmosphere wrong, they'd they'd bounce right out mm. and they'd just tumble off into space. So they had to hit. They had to hit the atmosphere just at the right angle, and but he did it. Yeah, he did it. He did it. And he did it by timing it on his watch. He didn't use any of it. He didn't use fly by wire <clears throat> because he couldn't. Mm-hmm. Fly by wire was sort of like the the autopilot that they had in the Mercury capsule at that time, and he couldn't use it. Right, he couldn't use it. He had to use his own wits and his own skill. Uh-huh. And a few others, like the one guy in Australia, like. Knowing the stars and the yeah, stuff, like, I'm sure that was artistic license. I doubt play, that ever played happened. by David uh, Golpe. 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 And yeah. this might have been this might have been her, like who we saw at the beginning of the film, being told that her husband was killed. Uh, the young young widow, Karen Lee. Yeah, I would say that was her. I yeah. think so. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just yeah, how the movie ends. You know, it was a perfect way to end it. Oh yeah, absolutely and perfect way to end it. Also, have to mention because Phil Kaufman, the director of this film, oh yeah, you know who he is, don't you? Oh yeah, Phil Kaufman, and absolutely. If you do or do not remember, because he was responsible alongside with George Lucas developing more of the Indiana Jones franchise, starting with you know the first idea for a story that that they came up with, and how Phil Kaufman he was the one that came up with the idea and inserting the Ark of the Covenant. Exactly. So, and it's nice to see because. And, he, and unfortunately, Phil Kaufman, he he was no longer attached to Indiana Jones because, you know, he, he went off to work on a Clint Eastwood film. That's said by George Lucas. But, you know, Phil Kaufman still got credit for his involvement in sure. the Indiana Jones franchise because, right. well, and you know what the thing is? Not only, not just George Lucas, but Phil Kaufman, the two of them were responsible for creating this. Yeah, yeah I mean, George Fantastic had, film. I mean, George had that idea George had that idea from from beginning to start, but when Phil Kaufman stepped in, they developed it more of Indiana Jones. But Phil Kaufman, because, yeah, he's a great director, and what he directed and brought to the right stuff, fantastic. Fantastic. He brought Tom Wolfe's uh, novel to life. Yeah, because this is based off of a novel, I almost yeah. forgot. Based off of a book, based off of the book by the same name by Tom Which Wolfe. Which I've read. Very good book, and it goes into more detail. But it's it's a very now, good book. I actually, I'd like to did, write, read it again. Now, did you see? <clears throat> did you did you read the book before the movie? Or yes, I read it before I saw it. So. Okay, yeah, and you just and you and you fell in love with the movie instantly when you first saw it. Oh, absolutely. Now you didn't see it in the theaters. No, I did not. But but on HBO, I saw it on HBO, and there was literally yeah. a, there was literally a ten it, minute intermission. Intermission. Uh, we were having the movie so long. We were talking about that because it's over three hours there, long. But it's it's a yeah wonderful movie. yeah. Three hours long for me, because of course, you know, I watched this film, you know, before we 
us doing our review, it took me, I told you this, and fun fact, you guys don't know this until now because I'm, I'm saying this, it took me all day to watch the film. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I watched it because it is, as of this recording, it is free, it is free to watch on YouTube. So, sure. so it, took anyway. me, it took me all day to watch it up until when I finally finished it because I let the credits play, I finished the film up to... <laughs> And I told you this, 12.43 a.m. Man, yeah, I you mean, did, you told me It's that. not like, yeah. a, look, I'll, clear, I, I'll point this out. I didn't start it, like, say, in the morning when I woke up, okay? So, mm. um, but, yeah, it is a long movie, and... But for, fantastic film. Yeah, but for you, because you've seen it, God, so, know, God knows how many times you can, I, I guess for you, you can easily watch this movie. So, here's the stamp of approval. Five stars. Our, our final thoughts and results on this film, well... For both of us, it's fantastic. And for this being... Five stars. Yeah, he, you, you give it five stars, and I was just going to say, this being one of your top favorite movies... Yeah, it's, and, it's my favorite movie. And fun fact, I just feel like mentioning this, it's true. I remember when we saw Captain Marvel, you were happy to see, because when Captain Marvel crashed into Blockbuster, she was holding a VHS copy of The Right Stuff. Very cool. I very, remember very, that. Very cool nod to that, yeah. You I, were, I love you, that. You were happy to see for that very time, happy to that see she that, was yeah. holding she was yeah. holding the VHS copy of your, one of your favorite movies. Of my favorite movie, yes. Yeah, that was, yeah, that was not... I'm, well, I'm sure that... I guess, you know, for the people at Marvel, they love that movie, so All right, I'm yeah. sure as though. But yeah, so you give it five stars? Five stars. For me, well, you know, what the heck, I'm giving it 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10 stars for the right stuff. What a great biopic movie centering on the astronauts uh, during, what was the name for that? Because of those astronauts, like that time. Um, just the right stuff? During the, or... during the right stuff, but it was back during the beginnings of the Mercury space program. And how it takes place throughout the 1940s? 60s. Well, 50s 60s. and 60s. Late 50s, early 60s. I think it did start somewhere in the in the late 40s, I think. Yeah. And then... John Glenn's flight, which was the third flight, it was February 20th, 1962. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we yeah. do see we do see texts of what like what's going on and like what year this yep. is taking place. So right. there's right. that. So again, he gives it five stars. I'm for me ten out of ten. The right stuff is a fantastic biopic film centering on the astronauts of the right stuff. Um, and like I said, probably right there next to say another great biopic film of astronauts, Apollo thirteen. Right. Sure. Yes. With any, with every biopic film, there are some stuff that did not happen, but at the same time, look, it depends, and it, ju it, it just has to work. Stuff that didn't happen, it has to work yeah, in exactly. biopic films. And yeah. I think for, in this case, for the right stuff, I think they, I think it managed, don't you think? Yep. Yeah, so, like, what we said about Gus Grissom, everything, yeah. So again, the film is great. What, and what about you guys? What do you think of the right stuff? Um... Like, you know, re like watching this three hour movie and, you know, if it, <laughs> if it took you all day to watch it like me, um, I don't know. And like, did you ever, I don't know, in case like it was, it was shown screened at theaters, if you got the chance to see it, just everything about the right stuff and what we've had to say about the film, our review and yeah, what yep, did, let us know. <laughs> yeah. What did you think of our review? Leave comments and give this review video a like as always. And so with that being said, thank you very much for watching. We hope you guys enjoyed our review of the right stuff. My dad's, one of my dad's top favorite movies. More review videos are on the way. They're going to be awesome. Keep looking forward and we'll see you guys in the next video slash review. And happy birthday to my dad. You know, a great opportunity to review this movie on the day of his birthday. Perfect, perfect opportunity. Take care and peace out.